morning, church. Mark, I think you're lovable. You look so cuddly in that sweater. <laughs> but, uh... I just want to announce a few things. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all of you from our first sermon where I asked you to say that you're all in. And I've had multiple people over the last few weeks tell me that they're all in. So I hope you guys are still all in. I hope you keep on telling each other that you're all in and inspire each other that you're all in. The second thing I want to inform you of is I've been tasked to help update the membership information and get some of this information. A lot of you have been given this piece of paper. I encourage you to fill it out before you leave today and give it to me or one of the elders. Uh, part of it is because we're trying to update all of our information. Email addresses change all the time. But also some of the other things that we want to get that we don't have records of are the dates that you got baptized or approximately and how long you've been attending Center Road approximately. So we would like to get that information for our records. So if you are able and willing, please fill this out today and give it to me, Lynn, or one of the elders. And, make, and just make sure it's all filled out. And we do have a paper shredder, so all this information is going to be shredded. So you don't have to worry about that. You know, one of the things that I like to do is I like to honor people every week. And there's a couple of people that I want to honor. First is Linda Wentz. And one of the reasons why I want to honor her is because, you know, she has a very behind-the-scenes job. And one of the things she does is she helps manage our resource room, which is a very big job. And as a teacher, especially for our kids, you know how important resources are when you're teaching. And we are just so blessed and so thankful that she does that. Another one that I want to mention is Glenda Sherrill. And the reason for her is we needed a volunteer to help with Golden Agers. And she volunteered. But not only did she volunteer, but she sacrificed and switched her days off at work in order to help over the next few months. And that is a huge sacrifice on her part. And see, I love people like Linda and Glenda who are showing that they're all in. And so continue on serving each other. And another thing I just want you to do is, I don't know everything that happens. And so I want your help. If you see someone do something that is glorifying God and building up Christ in the church, send me an email, send me a Facebook message, send something. And I want to use you guys to help honor each other at the beginning of lessons. So if you see something, let me know so that way I can brag about that person. Because we want to brag about what each other are doing and not ourselves. And there's just so much joy when you see someone do something for the Lord and you get to share and honor that. As, Clint, as Kerry said in his thing in Romans 12, we are to honor one another above ourselves. One of the joys of being a Christian is the ability to live beyond yourself. <clears throat> what I mean by that is the world teaches you to be selfish. Think about yourself. You know, selfishness is the greatest disease among people, and it always le leads to death, leads to sin. But when we start looking at what has Christ done for me, one of the greatest things he's done is he set us free from selfishness. And he says, no only do you have to think about yourself, you get the joy and the blessing of impacting other people, touching lives, making a difference for eternity, caring about other people. You know, one of the things that has gotten really popular over the last few years was this idea to experience God. If you ever read a lot of church growth books, <clears throat> like I do, one of the big in vogue things is experience God. And I went to this seminar that really emphasized this concept, and they're like, experience God. And this guy just was talking about how we need smoke machines and mood lighting and all this different stuff. And I'm like, well, that just seems fake to me. And the thing about that is I want some authenticity. I want authenticity. I'm a, I have a marketing background. I don't want to emotionally manipulate people to Jesus Christ. I want people to actually know Jesus Christ. And so when I thought about this idea of experiencing God, I've asked myself, how did Jesus experience God? And do, and do people struggle with the idea of experiencing God? You know, I believe there's a lot of people who are not going to ex truly experience God. 
You know, they're in the book of Matthew, where Jesus says, not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And the thing is, Jesus is going to say to them, I didn't know you. All the people are going to say, look at what I did for you, Jesus, A, B, and C. But Jesus is going to respond saying, I didn't know you. And sometimes we can get this mentality where you say, you know, I believe in Jesus. I go to worship service occasionally. I sing a few songs. But the question that I ask people is, do you really experience God? Do you truly know God? And have you really given him your heart? And how do we really experience God? Is it just being emotional? Because I can tell you a few jokes to make you laugh. I can tell a sad story to make you cry. We can do all the things to pizzazz you. But I think, how did Jesus do it? Because Jesus didn't have those things in his time, but he experienced God greater than anyone else who walked on the face of this earth. And I want people to experience him. I want people to know him. I want people to be in relationship with him. And so I thought about this concept and I asked, where, if you read in the New Testament, how does the scriptures really teach us to experience God? And the things that I'm going to show you here in a moment is going to show you that they're very difficult things. And they're the reasons why so many people will never, never, ever actually truly experience God. But do you really want to know Him? Does He have your heart? You know, here are the ways that the New Testament, if you actually read, actually show us how we truly experience God through suffering, submission, selflessness, sacrifice, surrender, self-control, self-denial, and service. If you ever read the, the New Testament, these are the ways that we see it. Because what did Jesus do for us? What did Jesus do in regards to God the Father? Did he suffer? Yes, he suffered death on the cross. Did he submit? He submitted to death. What is he selfless? He thought of you more than himself. Did he sacrifice? He paid the ultimate sacrifice. Did he surrender? He could say, I surrender all. Was he self-controlled? He didn't rebuke people when they were falsely accusing him. What, did he experience self-denial? He gave up the comforts of heaven. Did he serve? He got on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. And guess what? He experienced God. The reason why so many people will never experience God is because they don't want to do these things. We want to do the easy things that make us feel like we're close to God when in reality we're not. But I keep coming to this idea of this is how we experience God. You know, Paul makes known that he wanted to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to share in his suffering. How many of us say, I want to suffer? But the thing is, if you truly want to understand God, that's where you come and say, I want to suffer. I want to submit. I want to do all these things because that's why I really try to understand who God is and what he has done for me. But the reason why this is so difficult is because of another S word, and that is selfishness. Because we want everything to be about us. How's worship service about us? How are people meeting my needs? How's my spouse meeting my needs? How can I make myself look good at work? You know, one of the main things about experiencing God is learning to experience yourself less. And when we start doing that, the more we can have room in our hearts, less for ourselves and more for God. And one of the things that we have to understand is God gives us permission and the blessing to live beyond ourselves. When we start thinking about other people and the difference we make, those are the best moments in our lives. I mean, think about the best moments in your life. A lot of them have to do with the fact that you did something for someone else and you felt a way that you have never felt before and the only explanation was that you were selfless and you did something in service for that person. Even if it was at your own expense. Even though you sacrificed. But that, those are the moments when you truly say, I feel close to God. It's when you actually start becoming like Him that you really experience Him. That's why we're being holy as God is holy. We, ex we experience His holiness. And it helps us understand that's who God is. And that's what God has done for me. <clears throat> when I think about service, I think about how if you're really going to serve other people, if you're going to really be these things, you have to make your life about other people. You can't make it about yourself. But even the smallest thing you do for someone else can make a world of difference. 
When I think about this, I think about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is considered one of the greatest presidents we ever had. He was the one who sought unity in a broken nation. He was the one who, instead of saying the United States are, he said the United States is, because he wanted to show unity. And yes, he emancipated the slaves, but not just for political reasons, but because of moral reasons. It was the right thing to do. We praise him for all these different things. But one of the things I ask is, why is it that he became president? How is it that he became president? How is it that he was such a man that we look at and we say, he's a good president? Because one of the attributes about Lincoln that people like is that he lived beyond himself. <clears throat> one of the things about Lincoln was, in the human standpoint, he was not a very talented man. He was a failure in everything. He, bankroll, he bankrupted his businesses. He lost almost every election he was a part of. And the thing was, he was a failure. One, one of the things that he actually did was, he owned a general store. He owned this country general store, didn't make much money. And while he was doing this, he, he thought to himself, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to be a lawyer. And so he did all this research. He said, I want to get Blackstone's commentary of law. If I can just get these commentaries, I can self-teach myself and I can become a lawyer. Because you could do that back then. <clears throat> but those law books were expensive. But he said, someday, someday I'm going to do that. <clears throat> but in order for him to afford that, he started saving money. But there was this one day that I believe changed the face of the world. One day where Lincoln did something that demonstrated his character. He lived beyond himself. One day this poor family came up to his general store and they said, we're, we're absolutely poor, we're absolutely hungry. And this father is pleading for his wife and his kids for food and he's saying, will you just buy this barrel from me? This just ordinary, this ordinary barrel. And he said, the contents in it are not very significant. And he's saying, please, just give me whatever you're willing to give me because I want to feed my family, take care of my family. Now, Lincoln obviously wasn't a very successful businessman, and he was thinking, if I help this guy out, it's hurting my own dream of becoming a lawyer. But he said, I can't, I have to live beyond myself. I've got to help him. I have no choice but to help him because it's the right thing to do. So he pulls out 50 cents out of his pocket, and he gives it to that man. And the man is so incredibly thankful. And so Lincoln grabs that barrel and puts it in his storage room. Doesn't think about it for a long time. Because <clears throat> he didn't need a barrel. He was never going to sell the barrel. <clears throat> the guy told him the contents weren't significant. But one day, he was bored out of his mind, didn't have anything to do. So he went back and he opened up that barrel. And do you know what he found in that barrel? He found Blackstone's Commentaries of Law. The very expensive law books that he was aspiring to have. And he got them and he studied them and read them and became a lawyer, which springboarded his ability to become the President of the United States. It all began with one act of kindness, one act of generosity, one act of service. And that changed the whole face of the world. He lived beyond himself. And I think about this, he, this is how we're going to really become the Christians God has called us to be. Is, and this is how we're going to truly experience God. It's not just from being emotionally stimulated, even though emotion's part of it, we're to love God with our heart. But it's saying, I want to do the things Christ did. And what he did was he suffered, he sacrificed, he submitted, not for his own glory and his sake, but he did it for the sake of us, for God's glory. When I think about this, about experiencing God, I think about this passage in the book of Micah. It's a good book. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Starting in verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before Him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. 
You see, I think that's really the basis of how we're going to experience God. Because a lot of times, when we think about experiencing God, we think of this worship setting, and we think, you know, if I just go to God, worship a few songs, then that's where I experience it. And that's the mentality that these people in Micah were doing. If I just give all these different things, that's an easy external thing to do. But what God is really wanting is He's wanting your heart. He's wanting your life. He wants it so demonstrated that the way that you walk about life shows that you know God in relationship. You know, anyone can give of something, especially in America. We're, we're so affluent, we can give something and it rolls off our back. It's not superficial. It says, my faith is so legitimate you can see it through my character of actions. <clears throat> and when I think about this passage, I think about how, how we need to do these things. Are we acting unjustly? Are we loving kindness or mercy? Are we walking humbly? There's a passage in the Old Testament where we see the prophet Elisha kind of do this for a widow. And I want to read that passage. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 through 7. We see this story of this godly prophet Elisha. It says here, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in your house. And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. You see, when I read that Micah passage, I think of a, a story like this. Because Elisha demonstrated he knew and experienced God. He had a relationship with God, and it was demonstrated in how he responds to others. You know that people experience God and have relationship with God by looking at how they live in view of other people. I could say all day, I love God, but if I'm selfish, if I'm prideful, if I'm not thinking about you and I could care less, then that's not one who experienced God. But Elisha did this. He demonstrated what it meant to act justly. Can you imagine... What, this concept, can you imagine? I want you to, for a moment, take, put yourself in this woman's shoes. Because she had the worst of situations. And how many of you love justice? You know, the whole idea of justice is that you see something that is wrong and you say, that's not right. Something should be better. Something should be improved. When you think of all the different charities that we have in this world, Charities exist because of justice. Charities exist because of tragedy. And when people see that tragedy, they look at it and say, that's not right. I have to do something about it. When you think about church ministries that we have, once maybe you even started within the church, why did you start that ministry? Why do you partake in that ministry? Why do you serve in that ministry? It's because you love justice. You look at the world and say, that's not how things should be, morally. You open up the newspaper, the human interest stories hit the heart. Have you ever read those human interest stories or you see that story on the news or you read that story on Facebook and you're hit to the heart and you're hit to the heart because of the idea of justice. Something is wrong and it, something should be righted. <clears throat> this is exactly what Elisha experienced. This poor widow woman. And you look at her life and you say, that's not fair. That's not right for that kind of woman. This woman and her husband dedicated their lives to God, dedicated their lives to ministry to God. And she even mentioned to Elisha saying, my husband, your servant, feared God. And she made no, my case, you know, now the creditors are coming. We're really poor. We have nothing. 
We lost everything. And now we are taking my children. I mean, can you imagine how humble she is? Can you imagine losing your spouse? And, in the, and to make things worse, you have nothing. And to make worse on top of that, creditors are going to come and take your children away and make them slaves. You read that story in the Israel news and you would be like, hello, that's not right. That's not fair. A family like that should not suffer like that. That would hit you. She experienced bad thing after bad thing and she was a good godly woman with a godly husband who did godly work, who feared God. And Elisha didn't say, no, he didn't. By his response, he knew her husband was a godly man. He knew she was destitute and struggled. And he didn't say, oh, I feel bad for you. Or you should have saved in your 401k a little bit better. Sorry. It's all your fault. What did he do? He said, you know what? I've got to act justly. I've got to do what is right. And he said, what, what can I do? Tell me what you have, and I'm going to help you through it. The premier prophet of this time of God is looking at this woman and seeing her situation and says, I have to do something about it. Because I love God, I have to live beyond myself. You know, one of the worst tragedies we have in this world is people are suffering and struggling and hurting and we just walk by and say, you know what, I don't care. I'll feel bad for you for a moment. I might even say a prayer for you. Go and be well fed. Stay warm. But then we don't do anything about it. Think the parable of the Good Samaritan. The first few guys walk and say, huh, sorry. Should have brought a bigger knife. Should have walked with a posse. You know, they're very, just that indifferent attitude. They're so self-interested. They, they, can't, they don't have any room for anyone else. But how can you claim to experience God if you can't think beyond yourself and look at the lives of other people? Do people hurt so much that you say, you know, when something bad happens, not only do I feel bad, I love justice so much that I have to act. That's why I love that passage where it says, act justly. Not just desire justice, act justly. It means you take action. You are part of the solution. Not just an observer. I know one of the things that I think about, <clears throat> I, I have a friend and his wife, and they're, they're Christians, and they, they just fell in love with the people of India. And they, they met this guy who got converted to Christ, and he became a Church of Christ minister. And this, this Indian guy, he looked around, and he saw all the poor kids from the, because of the caste system and the poverty in the villages, and he said, I am going to do something about it. And so this guy who converted to Christianity, this native of India, set up an orphanage. And it wasn't very fancy. The buildings are horrible. The kids are horribly dressed. He's looking to just find basic rice just to feed the kids. I mean, he wasn't trying to build a mansion for the kids. He wasn't trying to build them something fancy. He just wanted to clothe them and love them and feed them and be the parent to them. <coughs> and so my friend and his wife got in touch with this guy. And they started saying, you know what? We're going to help you out. And they gave a little bit of money to them. And you know what? The guy was so grateful and he sent him pictures of kids eating rice and kids getting clothes and them putting on metal sheets on top of these huts. And these kids are just so grateful. I mean, these people mention, you know, heaven is here and America is here. That's why they think. And when my friends saw this, they're like, you know, we just gave a little. What if we just gave a little bit more to them? And more and more, they were making a difference. They were thinking beyond themselves. 
And at this point, when they started seeing the difference they met, realized, they said, this is the best feeling we have ever felt in our lives. We are acting justly. We're doing something that is right. Instead, I, we could have thought about our lives, bigger house, bigger car, and felt good for a while, but now I'm experiencing something I would have never experienced if I hadn't acted justly. <coughs> this minister was so impressed by my friend and his wife that they asked him to come visit India and preach. And my friend's a registered nurse. He's not a public speaker. He's not a preacher. His wife is an aerobics instructor. And they said, you know what? Your wife can talk to the women. You, you can preach to everybody. And when they announced to the village that these two people are coming to speak to them, the village just, just flooded. People came and flooded in. And here, my friend and his wife, they wanted to come, and, but they didn't have the money. They did not have the money to go to India. It was expensive. And so do you know what they started doing? They started selling the furniture. Because they said, you know what, it's better that these kids eat in our clothes than us having new furniture. And they sold their furniture. And their parents came up to me and they're like, Micah, you need to tell them they're selling their furniture to feed orphans. And I'm like, that's fantastic. <laughs> Wrong person to ask that. Go tell them not to do that. And you know what? They had a small group in their house. And you know what? Their small group sat on floors. Because that was more important. Justice was more important. And so when they went to India... The, the, my friend guest preached and he preached to this whole village and in that one day 50 people came and were baptized into Christ and he came back saying that was the most amazing experience I've ever experienced and it wasn't about him it was about God and it was about other people and he did what was just and I think that's one of the greatest blessings that we can have is when we think outside of ourselves and say Am I tired of just living how everyone else lives or do I care about justice? It's one thing to say, oh, I feel bad and I care about justice. It's another where God says, I actually want you to take action. Do you love people enough to take action where you're thinking, you know, I care about my brother. I care about my sister. I'll inconvenience myself. I'll sacrifice. I'll do whatever it takes because I'm thinking outside of myself. I'm not only concerned about my own spiritual life. I'm not only concerned about my life and my family. I care about each other. I act justly. That's how we should respond. Are we responding with justice? You know, one of the other things that, that we see here is we're to love mercy. You know, one of the greatest things that I've, I've, I've been realizing as I get older each year is how much I really start valuing mercy. You know, that's not my natural temperament. That's not my spiritual giftedness. But the more I understand I realized, you know what, everyone is struggling, everyone is hurting, everyone has a story. Everyone needs mercy. And when times are hard, everyone wants that merciful person. And a lot of times we have people who hurt us and criticize us and don't care about us. And I say we should be that one person in people's life that shows mercy, that they can always count on. Do I love mercy? The word love, it's not just mercy is a good thing, it's saying I love mercy. You know, one of the things that we see with Elisha from that story was he loved mercy. He asked the woman, what can I do? And he did what was necessary to help that woman. And he didn't just help her out. He helped her till she was overflowed with blessing. He helped her out until her needs were met. He loved mercy. And that's one of the greatest blessings we have, you know. I loved how Troy was quoting from the Beatitudes earlier this morning in his prayer because one of the blessings is blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. And time and time again, I love how Carrie mentioned Romans 12. In view of God's mercy, what do we be? You know, one of the things that we understand is we have been recipients of mercy. We need to know the value of mercy. You know, when I think about people in my life who have made the greatest impact, they were the people who cried when I cried, prayed for me when I struggled, were empathetic when I was hurting, and they were understanding when I failed. Those are the kind of people we want to be and we need to be, and those are the kind of people we can be for each other. Do we care about mercy? 
when we say, I care when your heart is hurting. I care when your, how, where your life is going. I care about the direction it's going and how you're feeling so much so that I'm willing to put my arm around you. I'm willing to hold your hand. I'm willing to pray right there for you. I'm willing to come to your house at 3 o'clock in the morning because I care. I'm not just going to think about myself anymore. I'm living beyond myself in mercy. Just how Elisha did. Can you imagine this? You know, one of the parts about mercy that I think about is I think about this part in a movie. <clears throat> There's a movie called The Blind Side. And it's about this woman named Leanne Tui. And she had everything that you would imagine would be the ideal American dream. Her and her husband were incredibly wealthy, lived in a nice house, kids went to private school, their kids were star athletes, they were athletes in college, one was a cheerleader, another one was a star starting point guard, they owned like a hundred Taco Bells, I mean life was good. But then they met this young man named Michael Orr who lived on the other side of town, bounced around from foster home to foster home, his, his mother was a drug addict. And so the story unfolds where they let him into the house and then they finally let him live with them. But there's this one scene where I see incredible mercy and it makes me cry. And she sets up this room for him and she sets up this, this futon for him as his bed because he's so big he needs one. And there Michael Orr looks at Leanne and says, I've never had one before. And she's there, and she's going, what, your own room? And he turns to her and says, no, a bed. And then he smiles at her. He's thankful for a bed. And she breaks down, and she's crying, and she leaves the room. You know, I can only imagine what she must have felt in real life thinking, you know, I had this posh, easy life, and I took things for granted, and here's a kid who had the hardest possible life, and he's thankful for a bed. How can you be so callous? If your heart is one that's not merciful, it's calloused. How can you not care about people? I think about how I'm in my pitiful state and how God saw me in my pitiful state and he has blessed me with his son Jesus on the cross. And not only that, he blessed me with a church family, he blessed me with a wife, he blessed me in all this variety of ways because God is merciful. He saw my state and said, I have to do something about that. I love mercy because I love Micah. And I think about that's what he's done for each of you. How do you love mercy? Enough to say, I have to do something about it. My heart is soft and it's not hardened. Elisha showed, I'm willing to love this widow. I'm going to take care of her. She was my friend's wife. How can I not? I mean, imagine putting yourself in that widow's shoes. Your husband dies, you have nothing, and your kids are going to be sold into slavery. What parent would not go and humbly beg someone for help? I would. And they did. And Elisha was willing to help because he loved mercy because he loved that woman. Do you love people genuinely? Because that's where mercy begins. But then we also see that we're to walk humbly. One of the main things I love from that Micah passage it says you are to walk humbly with your God. And what I love about that passage is the fact that we get to walk with God. And that's one of the things I love about that. Do you know that you get to walk with God? He gets to stand right next to you. We don't have to live life all by ourselves, all alone, but instead God is walking there right beside us. And the amazing thing is, anytime you stop to meditate and consider God, you are always going to be humbled. Because He's God, and He's perfect, and He's all-powerful and all-knowing, and you're not. But you're humbled because this being, this almighty God, loved you enough to say, I didn't have to care about you, but I'm going to stand right next to you. And as you're walking about life, I'm going to walk right next to you. You don't have to go about life alone. And this is why we can always have mercy and why we can always pursue justice because the humbleness is the beginning point of those two things. 
Humility begets justice and it begets mercy. And it takes that attitude that says, you know, I'm not better than anyone. And other people's feelings and lives and needs are just as legitimate as my own. And so as, as I know that I need Christ to walk next to me, I'm willing to walk next to them. But I'll do so humbly because I'm also walking with God. And the amazing thing is, as we're walking next to people because we care about people, we know God is on the other side. And so we, as we're walking next to people, we're always walking in humility because God is on the other side of us. And the thing is, you have to have humility to walk with God. If you're not walking in humility, you're not walking with God. It's only in humility do you walk with God. But walking with God allows you to walk next to other people humbly, saying, I'm going to help you through your hard times. I'm not going to judge you harshly. I'm going to love you with mercy. I'm going to understand. I'm going to empathize. I'm going to be sympathize. I'm going to pray. I'm going to care. I'm going to be compassionate. Because if God is willing to walk beside me, I should be willing to walk beside you. That's humility. And the amazing thing is, as we're walking next to people with them on one side and God on the other, we can help introduce them to the person who they need even more than us. And the fact is, because they're next to us, God's next to us, we can help them come to know God. We can help other people experience God in those ways that I've described earlier. Are you walking humbly? Are you saying, I'm willing to humble my own wants, my own needs, my own priorities, my own feelings, my own time, so much so that I can think about someone else's? Am I thinking about John Bodker's needs? Am I thinking about Alicia? Am I thinking about Larry? Am I thinking about Andy? You know, this is where, where we are going to grow. And these are the things that truly please God and where we experience God. It's not just singing a few songs, though God is glorified in that, and we should. But God is also going to love it when you do what Carrie read earlier and said, you know, we're a living sacrifice. We do it day by day. And how do we do it? How do we please God? We act justly, we love mercy, and we walk humbly. That's how you experience God. So I want you, in view of this challenge, and these three things, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you this. I want you to purposely do something kind for someone else every single day for three weeks. Can you do that? I'm asking you to do one thing for one person. I don't care if you're 90 years old in a wheelchair or five years old in kindergarten. You can do one nice thing for one person. I'm not asking you to sell your furniture and go to India, though if you do, I'll give you a high five. But, <clears throat> but even if you think you can't change the world, remember what Lincoln did? One act of kindness to a man and 50 cents change the whole world. I'm asking you to do one nice thing, and I want you to take this seriously. If you really do this, do something nice for someone every day for three weeks. And why? Because they say if you do something for three weeks, it becomes a habit. And the thing is, when we're kind and we're serving other people, serving other people becomes less of something we do and more of who we are. That's what I want us to be. We want to be like God. I want to challenge you to do this so that you will be like God. Not just doing the things of God, but actually being like God. So I'm challenging you to do this. I'm challenging you to act justly. I'm challenging you to love mercy. And I'm challenging you to walk humbly. And if you do that, this church will be transformed. The people around you be, will be transformed. But more so, you yourself will be transformed and into the likeness of Christ. At this time, as we're about to sing our song of encouragement and invitation, if you want us to show you justice and mercy and kindness and humility, let us pray for you. And if today you want to give your life to Christ 
and be forgiven of your sins. We give you the opportunity to repent and be baptized and demonstrate your faith and proclaim His Lordship in your life as we now stand at sing.